Hi, my name is Scott Gibson with Beneath the Surface. I'm here with Jay Taylor of Jay Taylor's Gold and Tech Stock Newsletter. Thanks for being with us, Jay. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be with you. Now, you're, uh, as your newsletter says, Gold and Tech Stocks. I wanted to talk to you about gold in particular, of where we're at with gold uh, in this cycle and how you th see things coming or going forward. Well, I think we're in a, what I like to say is a bull market of a lifetime for gold. And the reason for that, Scott, is that we are in a, a major credit deflation, a credit deleveraging, let's put it that way. And uh, during and, and the reason that's happening is that the debt has gotten too big relative to income, and so it's putting tremendous strain on the capital markets and on the on the uh, debt markets, and so people are fearful of speculating, and they're sticking and they're really going towards uh, uh, towards gold, which is really the ultimate money, uh, and we've seen it happen in other cycles, other major credit deflating cycles, but this is one for the ages. This is a big one. So I think that the real price of gold, which is what I like to look at more than the nominal price of gold, is in a tremendous bull market. The real price of gold has been rising relative to a basket of commodities, which in turn has made the major mining companies very profitable. And how far into that cycle do you think we are in terms of a, maybe a baseball analogy or something? A like baseball that? analogy? Uh, I think we could be at about four and a half innings in a nine inning game. I think we still have a long ways to go. It's, it's really hard to, to predict because it's when when the fiat currency system is going to change and you know there are a growing number of people that believe that we are inevitably heading back to some sort of a gold backed monetary system globally uh, for trading and uh, if that happens then uh, we could see a spike in the gold price and it could be over in a couple of years uh, but it's hard to predict but I think in terms of where gold is going price-wise in real terms, I think we're no more than half the way there, and perhaps only a third of the way there. And what about looking at 2013? What's your take there? Well, I think 2013 is going to be good for the nominal price of gold and asset values in particular. I think that we are seeing another breakout in asset inflation. My work uh, in my inflation deflation watch shows a breakout, and I think with uh, Ben Bernanke just starting QE Infinite mm -hmm. now, $85 billion more a month, that are going into the economy. I think that uh, we're going to see much higher prices, nominal prices. Real prices for gold, that's what I really want to watch because for the gold miners, it's what can you get for your ounce of gold relative to the cost of getting it out. And if so, if copper and energy are going up faster than gold, that's not good particularly. But if the real price of gold is rising, then I think that's really good for the miners. We'll talk a little bit about the miners in terms of uh, that's an area that you like right now that you've talked about in your publication. Yeah, so uh, de definitely. I believe that we are in a bull market of a lifetime for the miners as well because the real price of gold is rising, as I just said, in this deflation or in these credit deleveraging uh, periods. Uh, so yeah, there's a, but I do think that at the same time with this deleveraging issue, uh, and people are becoming much more risk averse than they were at other times. So the speculative juniors, the exploration companies that have to raise capital are not in the best position. So my preference is for companies that are producers uh, or that are employing uh, project generator models. They are much better uh, in terms of preserving capital and not blowing out their share structure. And preservation of capital is the big thing you're looking at there. It's just sort of risk reward in the stage of the market we're at. Talk a little bit about the, the joint venture model. Why do you like that? Why is it so attractive to you? The joint venture model, of course, gets other companies to spend money to drill expensive holes. And they usually have you know, top geologists that have been able to identify highly prospective ground and then stake that ground. And that's a relatively cheap thing to do uh, compared to drilling the holes. So when the guys come in and drill the holes, you get other people spending the big money. Uh, either they have the money or they have to dilute their own shareholder interest. So the, ca the project generator model avoids that dilution factor, preserves capital, and they have, usually have a large portfolio of stocks, so there are uh, projects, so that one of those are likely over time to, to come in big. Well, maybe they only keep 35% of a project or something like that, but if it's 35% of something that's very major, it's very significant because you don't have very many shares outstanding. Well, and that's key, that really they're diluting down the assets as opposed to diluting down the company. Right, exactly. Gives you a lot of kicks of the can. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. And can you talk about a few of those companies that either are in the joint venture model or the, the export or the production state? Production models. The, among the project generators, probably Eurasian Minerals is my favorite. And then in terms of uh, smaller producers that I like that are really starting to generate cash flow and grow organically as opposed to acquiring 
acquiring other companies. Dynacor Gold is uh, Dynacor Gold Mines out of uh, uh, located a base in Montreal, but in Peru, they should produce something like 100,000 ounces this year, and they're selling at about two or three times cash flow right now. And they also have a uh, an exploration project called the Tumi, Prom Tumi Pampa project that is a scar and porphyry target that is right in the middle of some really major companies. But they're not blowing out their share structure, they're taking the cash flow that they're generating from their production to explore the uh, Tumi Pampa. So it has both the best of both worlds. It has the potential to grow, it is growing organically, every year producing more gold, and at the same time has that exploration potential without blowing out its share structure. That's what I like about them. So and that's Dynacor. Dynacor gold mines. Tell us a little bit about uh, Eurasian. <clears throat> Eurasian Minerals is probably it's a company with projects all over the world, but they're not just little tiny projects. They're projects that have world-class world potential, and they have world-class gold mining companies and other mining, major mining companies that have big bucks, spending big bucks to earn and to find big deposits. And they're cash rich. And so uh, the other thing I like about Eurasian is they do, they do have some cash flow coming in the door uh, from a, a royalty that they picked up uh, something like six million dollars a year coming in from a royalty they picked up in Nevada. It's a mining operation uh, headed up by Newmont and that has lots of exploration potential. That could grow into something much bigger over time as well. So it's, a, it's preservation of capital, growth organically without without dilution of shareholder interest, which those are the themes I think in this particular environment investors should pay attention to. And in full disclosure, I do own Eurasian. I don't own Dynacor. Yourself? I own Eurasian and Dynacor. Thanks very much for being with us, Jay. My pleasure, Scott. Again, that's Jay Taylor of Jay Taylor's Gold and Tech Stock Newsletter. And my name is Scott Gibson with Beneath the Surface. Thanks for being with us.